Hi, it's Gadget UK here again, back forward of the Terrible Fire video. It's incredible how many of these boards I've been doing recently. So this is the beta for the TF1230. Uh, Stephen Leary has uh, excelled himself again. Sorry, a bit's fallen off all over the place here. Uh, yeah, he's uh, indeed excelled himself again and produced an 030 accelerator for the Amiga 1200. Now there's lots of these around, but they're a bit overpriced in places and stuff. Um, so it's always nice to have more competition and uh, this being open source is ideal It's the sort of thing you could build yourself now bear in mind This is a beta so this is not don't consider this as a review in any kind of way Really there are some issues with certain revision boards at the moment maybe fixed in firmware I think Stephen said he's uh, done uh, another revision of the board so this is a rev one here the beta so by the time you come to look at this you know consider building one yourself it might be on a version you know greater than version one so this pcb kind of came from goose actually he did uh, an order of i think several of these maybe 10 and then offered them out to the people on the exos forum there that were participating in the beta so very nice of uh, goose to do that and uh, i think it was only like five pounds or something for this it might have been 10 i can't remember i think it was about five um, but he also threw in the connector here as well and he provided me a voltage regulator and a um, crystal so I had a few things to get going you can see I'm getting greasy fingerprints on this already um, but I needed the uh, CPLD the RAM and the buffers here I wasn't too sure which parts to use and I haven't got Eagle on my PC so I couldn't open the uh, schematics and the board layout to work out what was required anyway uh, super duper saw my post on Exos forum and kindly offered to send me the chips which is uh, the guy is a legend he's an absolute legend You'll, you, you know I've mentioned super duper a number of times on my videos he built the TF 330s for the CD32 but he's also been building the TF 1260s um, and other cards and things as well but he sent me you know the IDE connector there the RAM crystal regulator jumpers uh, what's that that's the regulator I think so I already had a regulator from Goose but nevertheless it's always nice to have extras and uh, the buffer chips there uh, and the CPLD now I was having super trouble getting hold of the CPLD I was looking on like DigiKey, RS, Farnell, Mouser lots of places and I don't think I get the CPLD anywhere they were out of stock to like October November um, and it was the similar sort of thing with the RAM I could get the RAM from one place but then not the buffers the buffers I could only get from oh, I think DigiKey so I was having real trouble trying to find the parts and they sent me this full kit here including a socket another connector which is incredible and a gold top 030 50 megahertz CPU as well I am absolutely lost for words I'm losing my voice as well yeah super duper what a fantastic guy what an absolutely fantastic guy he's helped me out no end in the past with uh, compact flash cards to get some some of these terrible fire boards working helped me with the, uh, the tf330 helped me with the tf1260 he provided that tf330 as a kit that I built on my channel that we did as a giveaway the guy is a legend and he gave me a mouse adapter didn't he for me uh, a4000 and cd32 which i've used numerous times i'm not sure what these are these are from something else there yeah, this came from ebay today i need to work out what those are i'm not sure what i ordered them for now anyway as i've said lots of times maybe check out the tf330 video i'll put a link up there uh, because i'm not going to go through the entire build here i'll just have some highlights on fitting some of the things maybe show you the program on this one and then we'll cut to having to play around with it and see what works and see if anything doesn't so I'll start with these buffer chips down here I think. Uh, the sound in the background is the Pi Storm on test at the moment actually. I had to repair that recently. Let's just check from ground to there. Yeah that's right I think and I think that's 3.3. Yeah so the pin one marking is correct I think. Let me just inspect there. Yeah we've got 3.3 volts on the end pin there and the one next to it is ground so I'm comfortable that those are marked correctly. So I've anchored these things in place, just diagonals. I'm just going to get the CPLD on next. I'm going to do them all in one shot. You know, just drag a solder all of these. Once these main chips are on, then I can just focus on the jumpers and sockets and regulator and all that. So I'll just carefully get that on. I've made sure I've grounded myself before handling this. Where's pin one? Yeah, pin one's down here. I will just go and compare to some photos to double check that. The hardest thing with this by far is you've got to use magnification and then it's like micro adjusting this like this on all four sides so that you get it totally lined up and equal spacing so that you can solder on.
and then just inspect to make sure everything is totally straight and it is And there we go, that's one side. I did have to add a bit of extra solder there on that side of the CPLD I showed you. But uh, yeah, hopefully these should be a little bit easier. Let's just get some flux on there. Might have too much solder here initially. Let's just uh, dab into it. Need more solder there. It's got a little blob on the end, let's just see if I can get rid of that. There we go. So it's taken about an hour and a half, roughly, to build that. The hardest part is the through-hole stuff, if I'm honest. You know, years ago, I would have said to you that the SMD stuff would be the scary bit, but you know what? It's the opposite. And not really scary, but time-consuming. These SMD parts, once you've done this sort of thing, uh, you know, several times, a board like this several times, you start to get pretty quick at doing the SMD stuff and the through-hole stuff, like the sockets, and especially that connector there, they take blooming ages. I despise doing the through hole parts on these now. These four chips here probably took me, all in all, including the filming and messing around there, about 15 minutes to get all four chips on, which is not bad. So I'm just going to inspect it for any shorts and stuff and go and program it up. Now one thought that springs to mind, fit that connector very, very finally at the end because if you need to reflow around this obviously it's going to restrict your access just in the corners here i mean not too bad but yeah i would fit something like that at the end so yeah i think we're all right I just need to check there's no shorts same thing as you see me do before just measure between ground and vcc ground and 3.3 5 volts and 3.3 you know just check there are no shorts on the power side there and then just inspect to make sure nothing looks like it's bridging and then i think i'm going to check to make sure that goes to 5 volts and ground and we'll power it with 5 volts and ground and connect it up via the jtag here using the xilinx programmer and hopefully it will work make sure we don't have any shorts here Yeah, no shorts on the power rails there. Uh, and I think what we can do here, we know, uh, where's VCC now? I think VCC on these is up here, isn't it? It's that pin. So that's 3.3, I think, which should be there, is it? Yeah, that's 3.3, so as to this. No, so I think this is five volts and ground, actually. We can work out the ground easily just by testing from one of the 7.4 series here. Yeah, so ground's at the top. That bottom pin there must be 5 volts. So flipping it over, this I think is the 5 volt pin. Let's just test to there. There. Yeah, so it's pin 3 is 5 volts, I think. So I think it's ground at the top, 5 volts at the bottom. So I'll start by doing my usual thing. Uh, it's got a jumper in there, look. Of powering this. Ground at the top. 
and I'm just going to put my finger on there while I do this actually very carefully connect that up, hang on there we go just make sure, because what I want to make sure of is nothing's going nuclear here and it isn't just uh, flip this over and measure on volts DC yeah look, plus 3.3 .3, and I think 5 volts in, yeah yeah, so 3.3 .3 volts there. So we know that that's okay. Nothing is getting hot or anything, so I'll just power that off. And again, I'm sorry you've seen this a million times before, perhaps. I'm going to connect my JTAG connections up here. This can be a pain to do because you've got to get all of them on. I mean, you can do them individually, but I like to hold them together, make sure I don't disconnect any, and then try and get them all on. And I've missed some in the middle there. Look. Of course, do check the order of these before you power it on. There we go. So I've got TMS, TDA, TDO, TCK, ground, and VCC uh, being 3 volts, 3.3 volts. So if we uh, connect this up first, ground towards the top, and then we plug this into the PC. And if the 3.3 volt is there from the, you know, the regulation, you'll get a green LED there. So again, I'm using Impact 10.1 here, and if I cancel that and we double click boundary scan, right click, initialize chain, fingers crossed, we got our CPLD. So I just need to go find the firmware now. So I stuck the firmware in the root of E there, if I now click OK and then right click program, I think it does a verify at the end anyway, but we'll just do another one just to make sure. Program succeeded, right click, verify. Looking good. So I'm going to disconnect the JTAG and then disconnect the power for the 5 volts. And if we carefully move these things out of the way and of course I can pull my connector off there stick it back on here I like to do that because they're always in the right order I don't have to mess around with them look uh, and I'll do the same with the power one wherever that's gone I think I used that power one for one of the other terrible fireboards which needed something to stick in there rather than having a jumper on it so I'm going to clean it up afterwards because you never know I might need to do some rework on it yet but uh, we can now get the look at that that's lovely gold top CPU into there just inspect the pins, make sure they are all straight, and I believe they are. That's pin one, which uh, I think goes up here. And obviously, you can correspond the odd pins that stick out there to the profile like that. Yeah. For a minute there, I don't know why I thought the socket was on the wrong way. Good God, that went in really stiff, didn't it? I'm just going to take that back out because you know what? I didn't like the sound of that. It probably went in okay, but it did make, let's face it, a pretty nasty snapping sound, didn't it? So it's not going to do any harm just to try and get it out. Quite mysterious how he's managed to get a gold top 50 megahertz CPU that looks new. Yeah, so the pins are all alright. I think it's just because it had never been in a socket, or that socket had never been used before. Yeah, same thing. Nice, firm fit. So, let's go and plug that in. Good God, you won't believe how hard that was to get in. I think it's because that connector has never been used. Someone did previously point out, a few people actually on my board, that my connector there has not been uh, sanded down. You know, it's not been... Uh, edge, the edges smoothed off. Anyway, let's switch that on and see what happens. So the weird thing is, the first power on did nothing. All it did is power cycle it, and then suddenly it's booted up. So AGA 030, 64 meg of fast RAM, and uh, everything's working. It did boot from the hard disk. So I think I need to run uh, sysinfo, you know, syscheck, not sysinfo, syscheck, and test all the RAM. But first impressions are, this beta certainly works fine for me on this uh, Rev2 uh, point whatever board it is, I forget, I'll put up left, top left. Let's go into sysinfo, let's just have a look at the specs just to make sure it's running properly and stuff, a speed test on it. 
Yeah, so we've got 6282 dry stones, which, strangely enough, is only 1.35 times faster than a 68030. Which would suggest it's not running at full speed there. That is a bit weird. That is very weird. Could be a consequence of the firmware. All the caches are on there, so that's a bit strange. That's for checking AIBB. Now I've, uh, hang on, unable to turn the difference. Yes, yeah, full 68030. Yeah, it says there, 50 megahertz. Let's just do a uh, memory test, that should come back really fast. Yeah, there we go, faster than a 4040. Uh, let's do a sieve. Yeah, that's kind of what I'd expect. It's uh, much faster than a 3025, isn't it? Let's do flight point math. It should be double a 3000 at 25. Now, in sysinfo, it didn't look that way, did it? Yeah, you see, it's not there. I don't quite understand what's going on there. Yeah, anyway, it's certainly working. So I am very pleased. Yeah, it's testing the RAM here. It's just gone round the first pass. So all 66 meg, uh, you know, the 64 meg and fast and the 2 mega chip are okay. So I'm going to have a scrub with the brush first and then we'll put it in the ultrasonic cleaner. I just find that if you get the majority of it off first, the ultrasonic cleaner obviously has a, an easier time. I don't have to do it for very long, maybe five minutes instead of 15 or something. I'm just going to take this thing out here again. I just don't tend to use that to be honest. It's probably a good idea. You can see all the contaminants at the bottom of that. That is literally the same IPA I've used a number of times. I'm just going to lob this in here. Just going to add a little bit more because a little bit has evaporated over the period of time. And let's switch it on. No heat. Anyway, it's set the lid off. I've not uh, been screwing this on just because I've been going in and out of this machine regularly. Um, now I've updated the firmware again to the release Candidate 1 firmware. There have been four or five different firmwares that Stephen has produced as he's been working through the problems because whilst it works on my 2B board here, I think on the is it 1D4, I think one of the earlier revisions, there was a problem. Uh, now from what I understand it was something to do with AutoVec. Uh, so anyway, I'm just going to just ground myself. I've got the ESD wrist strap here actually, let's just put that on. So I've got the wrist strap on, don't want to take any chances because we're on the carpet here. The interesting thing is this card goes in and out really easily and the last time I tested this I found that it wouldn't work when I connected it back up and uh, I just reseated it and then it was alright. So I think it's just because this card seems to have a slightly uh, looser slot. Let's just pull that out. So yeah, for the observant, the edges here, I mean, I think I did go over this with the file just very lightly, but there's not much of a slope there, you know, and that can make a difference. You can actually tear up the pins on here if you're not careful, but anyway, these are perfect. So as I say, this has got RC1 firmware on there, and I think the IDE should work now, so I'm going to detach the IDE from the TF1260, and we'll connect it up here, and it should just boot, actually, as normal. Let's just move that out of the way. Now this card, I just find so much harder to get in. Let's just see, see what happens this time. Yeah, can you see that? It's like the slot compared to the other one. There you go, it's much tighter. I don't know why. Th there must be some variance on these uh, things here. Anyway, let's just disconnect this. Um, yeah, it's got the key thing there and it goes the same way up by the looks of things. Do you know, there's one thing I hate about these IDE connectors, and it's getting them off. There you go, that's not, not too bad. The best way is to just do that, because otherwise if you bend too much one way or the other, you'll just bend the pins. You can see those are totally straight. So let's put that out of the way. And uh, yeah, it's keyed. Pin 1 should be up here, but you see there's, uh, there's no mark in that. I think that's going to be correct, actually. I think Stephen will have gone for the exact same layout there that he's used on the 1260. Let's just put some pressure underneath and press it on. Yeah, that's it. Uh, just for good measure, I'm just going to put this on here because you know what, it's just kind of touching the carpet a bit there, isn't it? Normally this sits on a desk. So let's just uh, put the keyboard back here and uh, that back on there. And we'll connect up power and video. And we'll switch it on and see what happens.
Nothing. Getting no video there. Yeah, there's something wrong. Now it's strange, but I had exactly the same issue there. You saw what was happening, I was getting no video. The screen just went blue as if there was no video, and the LED went off there. And I tried that a few times, the same thing. I just reseated the car, pushed it as far in as I could, and then it was all right. So I think it's all about my slot. But if I switch it on now, we get the same thing, but yeah, it's booting now, look. Yeah, I am not sure what happened there then. Just for my own peace of mind, I need to test this a few times. The clock's not right there, look though. 08, 08, 08, 8, 10. So there's a problem with the real-time clock, it seems, which is interesting. I'll point that out. It's obviously, you know, it's a clock port clock, this. And it seems to be running here. Let's do a quick benchmark. Let's see what this comes up with here. Because from what I understand, Stephen's now got burst mode on. Yeah, that's looking pretty good now. Very, very good, in fact. If you look at a 680305 with two 0 0.05 times as fast, which is what you'd expect because this is running at 50 instead of 25. Yeah, it says there 51.8. That's not accurate, but everything there seems okay. Let's have a look at the drive speed. Um, now, this is the onboard, you know, standard stock interface on the 1200s. This can be, I don't know, 2 megish. There you go. Surprisingly, that is faster than it is with the 060 for me. Uh, anyway, let's try. Um, DH0. This might be the fast, you know, E H I D E. No, that's 3 meg. And we'll try DSH0. That again is an onboard IDE. So that should be slow. It's not the, the one on the card. Yeah, so the one thing I would say is the E H I D E is not running at full speed at the moment for me. I'm getting 3 meg, but you see I get like 5.4 meg on the 060. I mean, that could just be because it's so much faster and the clock speed's running faster there as well. But that's pretty good. That is, uh, is very good in fact. It's way better than the stock 1200 for sure. So I'll have a quick look in AIBB. Um, I do want to reboot this a number of times in a minute though. Uh, it's a full 030. So I did a dozen or so boots, actually, you know, power cycles, uh, cold boots, and uh, it's worked fine, no problems at all. The only thing I've just done is set the time and date there, and actually that's okay. So I think the time and date getting corrupted was just some, some consequence of swapping over the cards there, actually, because it's kept that. The date and time there is correct. It is 10.50, 17th of the 9th, and I did a power cycle. So that seems all good. And I played some demos and games and things and everything seems to be running fine on there. Um, let's just try Doom and I'll show you at Scum VM. And I guess this is also an update to the TF1260 as well because I updated the firmware to that. Uh, now, Stephen has released a public beta firmware actually. So if you own a TF1260 uh, and you engage with some of the guys on the Exos forum, they'll tell you how you can perhaps use a Raspberry Pi to program it or you could send your card back to the uh, builder of your card if you've purchased one and have it updated with the latest firmware. Now the latest firmware has not got the serial number for your device but from what I understand at some point later this year it will all go public and it will be open source and there will be a way for you to perhaps sign your firmware with your serial number that you were originally given and reflash to the very latest version because I'm sure there'll be perhaps little tweaks. I think Stephen said he's going to do another version of firmware for the TF1260 to sort the chip RAM speed out and to get it running a little bit more stable with some CPLDs because uh, you can, they all run fine, they're all stable but like on my system I can't run past 62 and a half megahertz and I've got a couple of processors here that will definitely, definitely go above 75 that one of them is marked at 75 uh, and, and I'm, it is a genuine one um, so anyway, we'll cover that in another video when we get another update at some point but nevertheless, I thought it'd be worth just comparing these things. So we'll load Doom here, and then we'll have a look at Scum VM just to see how that performs on the 50 MHz 030. I'm guessing it's going to be nowhere near as good as it is on the 060. So the way I've set this up now, this is uh, you can consider this an update from previous videos. 
I have uh, Paul doing the music and stuff here as well as the sound. I didn't think the Amiga could do that, but yes, it can. So that's on the EHID interface actually, uh, I think. So if we load Scum VM here, I'm guessing this is going to be way too slow on an 030. You really need an 060 for this. But I think you might be surprised in terms of the firmware update of the uh, TF1260 when I show you that in a minute. It runs so much better than I demonstrated in that uh, review of the TF1260. So just a quick look at Frontier, we've seen it all before but it's useful just to see how smooth this is and it is very very smooth.
So let's get the TF1260 back in. Uh, I really should ultrasonic the TF1260 actually. I've cleaned this card with the ultrasonic cleaner. Um, but the, you know, I didn't get that ultrasonic cleaner until uh, much later than, uh, you know, I had my TF1260. Anyway, let's uh, try and get this out. Amiga 1200 cards are difficult to get out there. So let's just uh, try and tilt that down there. I pull it out from the underside. Yeah, so processor is hot. You would want a heat sink. And uh, one thing I did notice there is these are hot. Not too hot, not boiling hot, just hot. So yeah, you would want a heat sink on there, a heat sink on here. And there is enough space, I think, within there. Um, maybe heat sink your RAMs. Now, interestingly enough, I've got 64 meg here, but from what I understand, the, certainly the current firmware, from what I read on the forum, if you've got the 128 meg of RAM here, it just works, it detects it. So there's some intelligence there in terms of it uh, you know, auto, being able to auto detect whether you've got 64 meg or 128 meg. So, I mean, what I'd like to do at some point, if someone can tell me what chips I need here, I'll go and post on the forum about that in a minute. Uh, I'll ask the question, what chips do I need there? And I might remove these with some hot air and fit the 128 meg there. It, you could argue it's a bit pointless, really, because you know what, 64 meg is a crazy amount of RAM and more than sufficient for everything on the Amiga, really. There are one or two exceptions. Beneath the steel sky, there's an awful lot of discs to that. I mean, crazy amount, like 11 or 12 or 13 discs. If you load that into a device like this, you know, you've got 128 meg of RAM perhaps, you'll find it fills majority of that RAM up. Um, now, I might be thinking of the CD version with FMV and everything, but yeah, that's the only sort of use case for really something like that, unless you're going to use productivity software, you're know, going to use things like Lightwave and do rendering and stuff like that, uh, in which case you'd probably want to use a 4000 or something really for something like that. But you can see how clean that was after coming out of the ultrasonic. It is incredible, absolutely incredible. It looks new. Uh, so let's do the same thing we did before. If we can, wrist strap's still on. I mean, in fact, we can't with this one, we've got to pull it because it's uh, a different type of connector. Look, oh, I think I just probably just bent those pins there just slightly. No, they're all right. And let's get the TF1260 back in. I forgot already where pin one was now. It was like that, wasn't it, actually? Because the notch went at the top there. This, that's one reason I should have a keyed connector on here, actually. Yeah, the gap for that there is at the top, so it goes that way. So pin one's up here. Oh, there it is. There's pin one. Ignore what I'm saying. That's just a dot on the silk screen. That's not nothing. That's actually pin one. So, yeah, we are correct with that. Let's just carefully press that on. And let's get this back in. So I'm just making sure. You can see when I did the review there, I taped that down with some double-sided uh, tape there, double-sided pad, and used the original thing that comes with it. It's like a thermal transfer pad, and that stayed on. Even when you move the wire around like this, it stayed on firmly. And this has been out of here, and well, in and out of here, several times as I've been doing firmware upgrades to this, and obviously the TF1230. So let's uh, carefully get that up there like that. I need to make sure these wires here I'm not getting trapped. I need to get this wire here out of the way. That's the enable. It's a switch on the back so I can switch off and on the 060. But as I said in the review, you lose the RAM when you do that as well if you disable the 060. Uh, but nevertheless, you do have to have that jumpered or you won't have a processor. Um, can we put this on top or does that go underneath? I don't know. So let's try and align this. It's super hard getting this in and out, it really is. Oh, there we go. So, that's that, that wants to go there. The fan wire wants to come out and have the black wire to the right. That's it. And then of course I need to reconnect the thermocouple here. I covered this in a previous video and the thermocouple there, if you want to get one of those yourself. So let's just uh, put that down there like that, make sure that's on. And fingers crossed, switch it on. Yep, I think that's Boone. Is it? Or is it black screen? No, it's Boone. I was very nervous for the first few seconds when I powered this 1200 on. I mean, it has been recapped, but uh, yeah, I just don't want to create any damage to it. There you go, that's the second reboot. So it's loaded the driver into uh, memory there and it's uh, should boot up this time. What you can do, and this was thanks to Andy Tricklebank, I was aware of the process, but he just reminded me and actually showed 
uh, and po posted on the forum, I post links down below, ways you can do this. Use Remus and something else, a couple of utilities there, there's a couple of scripts and things you can run. But you can build your own Kickstart 3.1 runs that contain the EH IDE driver within them. So you don't need the double boot thing in order to you know, boot from the EH IDE. The time and date is correct there, so it's not lost that between cycles. So I'm not, not sure what caused that. There obviously was a glitch there at some point. Now, if I load Scum VM again now, bear in mind we're running at 62.5 megahertz. I think you should drink that. It looks bad for you. Nonsense. It makes me feel great. Smarter. More aggressive. I feel like I could. Like I could. It's a hamster! Just what I need for dissection lab tomorrow. I think I need that for the band, Laverne. You know, like we could bite its head off or whatever. together three times, and already you're telling me you just want to be friends? You never gave me a chance, and for that... You'll fry like a pork sausage. like you, it's just that, well, you're too nice a guy, I guess. I think I'd rather go out with someone more unpredictable. But uh, yeah, that was just a quick look at the beta version of this, the TF1230. 
Bear in mind, like I said at the beginning of the video, there may be a Rev 2 or something, so by the time you get one, it could be different, and maybe some different features and things. But this is rock solid with the uh, release candidate one firmware. Uh, and again, there may be a later version of firmware, so you know, just do have a look around and research things before you flash it. And as usual with Stephen, he's put some comments and things on the uh, PCB here. Predicted ignorance EAB comments that he's missing at the end there, because he obviously he's had to trim that down. No FPU? Useless. Yeah, that is a common comment, actually. Lots of people say, has it not got an FPU? Oh, I don't want that. You know, it's not got an FPU socket. No one really uses the FPU. All right, there's some demos use it. And you can use it with an, um, a browser. iBrowser uses it. You know what? If you're going to use iBrowser, get an 060, get the TF1260. I wouldn't attempt to use an 030, I don't think. So it was fantastic to add this feature of the EHID interface here. You know, it means you can have uh, an extra pair of drives effectively because I think you could run two drives off this but also it's super fast now it didn't come out that fast here in my tests but again we're on a beta firmware maybe you'll tweak the speed of that as you know he's tested it on more people's machines and stuff and see if you can go up to PAO4 it might already be running PAO4 it's just basically the 030 that's l the limit here you know it's using PAO isn't it um, but 3 meg was not too bad for me on my 1200 but I do know like with the 536 and get 3.6 meg on that and that hasn't got an EHIDE so I'd suggest that maybe this is capped at the moment as Stephen's just uh, testing things out with uh, the release candidate firmware and of course it's nice that this supports 128 meg or 64 meg so you've got some flexibility there and if you're interested in pricing for something like this if you wanted to build one yourself I think Pillock last night said on JLPCB you could get 10 of the PCBs for £62 roughly. Um, now I think that included the underneath here pre-assembled like this one was which is really nice because that takes most of the work and effort out. So if you imagine what's that about £7-ish for a PCB if you were to buy it from a seller you know it might be £10 or £12 for a bare PCB and then the actual cost of the components and the chips and stuff you're probably looking at 60 to 70 pounds ish so i would suggest something like this you could build yourself for around the 80 pounds mark now don't expect you could buy them built at that price because obviously someone's going to take an hour or two or three maybe you know if they're doing extra tests and things on it um so you might be expecting to pay i would say between 120 and 150 pounds for something like this bear in mind it runs at 50 megahertz try and find another 1200 accelerator that is cheap and affordable less than 200 pounds that runs at 50 megahertz that has either 64 or 128 meg ram with eh ide you know pio mode 4 ide you're not going to find one so a huge thanks to super duper he is a builder of things like this of the tf1230 and the tf1260 i'll post a link down below you can contact him on the exos form if you want to buy something like this and i bought the board here from goose actually he, he ordered some from jlpcb i think and he prov kind of provided the connector here um and i think super duper provided the socket so yeah, thanks very much to those guys, Goose and Super Duper. But a huge thanks to Stephen Leary, because without Stephen, things like this would not exist. And I think we're approaching a time in the next few months, as I say, where some of this stuff will become open source. Stephen's going to gift it to the community and open source it. Uh, so, you know, I was thinking uh, you could do a mod to something like this. In fact, the TF1260 is what appeals to me, if he did make that open source. Uh, mod it so that you could create a, a board that goes in the CPU slot and a 2000 had a lot of an 06 out of 2000 but that's me being crazy because you know a lot of the software that you need to know 60 you need AGA really or uh, RTG you know but you can get an RTG card for the 2000 so I don't know it'd be quite an interesting project that I'm sure there's going to be a few other people perhaps interested in doing something like that anyway hopefully you found that interesting thank you very much for watching and I'll catch you in the next video